May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I read a great book recently called Destiny, Dis- Discipline is Destiny, yes, I know it so well, by Ryan Holiday. There's a chapter in there called Seek Discomfort, and he shares the life of the famed Stoic philosopher Seneca. Now, Seneca was a highly educated man. He came from a great family. He had everything you could ever possibly want in life. He had fame. He had wealth. Everybody came to Seneca to gain wisdom from him, to be his follower, his disciple, even Nero, the emperor, who later became insane. And he was so fabulously wealthy that people were surprised that he had this practice, this spiritual practice, where he put the brakes on worldly success. And every so often, for about a month, he would live a life of poverty. He would eat grimy bread, and sometimes he would subsist on nothing but berries and water. He would dress in rags. Now, a lot of people thought, oh, this is cute. This is just some wealthy eccentric who's trying to pretend like he's poor. In fact, did you know that seven centuries later, Marie Antoinette used to do the same thing? She would dress up as a peasant and as a lark would pretend to feed the pigs. It was something that she thought was fun. So people thought that what Seneca was doing was cute. It wasn't cute. There was a point to all of this. It wasn't just philosophical. Seneca was also being practical. He knew that everything he had, his success, his wealth, his health, all of it could be taken away like that. So he wanted to be prepared. And he wanted to make sure that nobody had any kind of power over him. He did not want to be a slave to the trappings of this earth. Because if it lost, wouldn't matter. And nobody would have power over him wasn't so much the case with his associates. His associates, the people he hung around, they were terrified of losing their wealth, their power, their position, so much so that they would sell out their family and they would sell others out. Now, Seneca actually had to live up to this. Nero, the emperor, was quite mad. And for some reason, he became enraged with Seneca and threatened to take away all of his wealth, all of his states, Seneca said, by all means, sir, take it away. I'm fine. I know how to live in poverty. Well, this this enraged Nero. And so he sent some assassins to poison Seneca. But they couldn't do it. They were hoping to slip something in some stew or some wine, the, the fine meals that the rich had. But Seneca was used to eating berries and drinking water, so they couldn't poison him. Now, Seneca lived after the resurrection of Jesus, and it's doubtful he knew much about the teachings of Jesus. But if he had, he would realize that his wisdom was really nothing new. Jesus' central message focuses on warning us not to get too attached to this world and their comforts, not just for a spiritual reason, but for a practical reason as well, because guess what? It can all be taken away just like that. And Jesus demonstrates that during his 40 days in the desert. You know, in our reading in Mark's gospel, it only mentions his time in the desert briefly. There is a fuller count in Matthew and Luke's gospel, and I encourage you to read that during this Lent. You see, when Jesus goes into the desert, it really mirrors our own life. When Jesus goes into the desert, he effectively encounters the world that we live in, all the wild beasts and temptations. Satan tempts Jesus three times, but those three temptations, they reveal the exact same temptations that we all receive. The first is bread, bread to satisfy the hunger. 
Satan approaches a starving Jesus and offers him stone and says, I will turn it into bread. What he's really saying is he's tempting him with the materiality of the world. The second temptation is power. Satan leads Jesus up a high tower and he says, I will give you all these kingdoms of the world. Power. We crave power, right? Because power brings us security. It gives us what we want. It makes us think we're in control. The third temptation is interesting. He takes Jesus up to a high ledge and he says, if you fling yourself off this ledge, I'll take care of you. Now, that's the temptation of despair. And it's also the temptation of us wanting to get rid of the pain and the sorrow that exists in this earth. So, those are all three temptations. And sometimes we may not take those drastic measures, but we do anything we possibly can sometimes to turn our backs from the sorrow and the pain of this world. It is a temptation. But Jesus three times refuses. And I love how in his refusal, he takes himself out of the equation. He responds and he says, man cannot live by bread alone. Worship the Lord your God, serve only him. Do not put your Lord God to the test. This is what his refusals communicate. I may live in this world, but I'm not ruled by it. I will not be a slave to this world. You can take it all away. My life belongs to God. I am with God, and God is with me, not this world. Now, those are very important for lessons for us as we travel this life. Because during this life, we're going to travel through the desert. We will encounter wild beasts. And we will face the temptations of this world, temptations that promise us the comfort of materiality, power, and control, and a life without suffering. But come on, these are false promises. Because our material possessions, our power, and our yearning for a life of ease and comfort, come on, they can be taken away quickly, right Through an accident, an illness, fortunes come and go. That's why the season of Lent, oh, the season of Lent, that's a real gift. Because Lent calls us to figure out what it is that makes us attached to this earth. It calls us to examine our hearts and say, where does my heart really lie? It calls us to be careful who or what we depend on because that can be taken away quickly. It helps us to develop practices that not only strengthens us physically, but spiritually as well. You know, I actually did give up chocolate one time for Lent, and that was a good thing because if I ever, you know, if I was ever diagnosed with diabetes, I'd be like, I'm good. I know how to give up sweets. So, It helps us. It reminds us that if something is taken away, we can do that in the same way Seneca did and in the same way that Jesus pushed back against Satan in this world, saying, wealth, materiality, and power, I will not be a slave to that. By pushing back against Satan, Jesus proclaims that the world does not power and dominion over him. Jesus is one with God, and God is one with Jesus. May we do the same. Whatever it is we are giving up during this Lent or taking on, whatever practice we assume, may we do so as a reminder that we are not of this world. Instead, we are one with God, and God is one with us. Amen.